Let's continue the heart of that song in prayer together. Our Father, we want to come together with our hearts and minds right now and be low before you, properly low, because to you belong the glory and the praise. So for all of us who feel even this past week we've had self-seeking, glory-seeking ambitions and lives, we pray that you would forgive us, we pray that you would help us to see your beauty, your glory, your holiness, so that we have a proper humility before you. So we pray as we hear your word now that you would, by your Spirit's power, open our minds to understand your word rightly, to see it clearly, change our hearts so that we would receive your word, and we pray that you transform our lives as a result of this, for your glory and our good. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can open up your Bibles to the book of James. We're continuing our series in the book of James. We're in chapter 5, in verse 13 to 18. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one. There's Bibles all over the room under the seats in front of you. And our text this morning is on page 1013. Well, James wrote this letter in the first century to Christians like us, whose lives are often divided. So we see throughout this letter that these Christians like us have divided loyalties, divided passions. This leads to divided relationships. And this letter of James gives the wisdom that makes us whole. So in our text this morning, we see the central role of prayer in all of life. So we talk about prayer a lot as a church, We pray in various ways a lot as a church, and this is because Christianity is a real, a vital relationship with God, and prayer is at the heart of the Christian life. But maybe you feel like you are bad at prayer. One author said, if your tendency is to think you're rather wonderful, just remember your prayer life. So maybe you feel uh, like you are too busy for prayer. Maybe you remember and heard the quote of Martin Luther and how he was too busy not to pray. Apparently, he said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Now, that is meant to inspire us, but it may discourage you if you struggle at prayer. So, I want to share another quote from Luther about his prayer life. He wrote to a friend who thought very highly of him, and he said, Your high opinion of me shames and tortures me since, unfortunately, I sit here like a fool and hardened in leisure, pray little, do not sigh for the church of God. So, even Luther, if that first quote is true of him, this is how he also spoke of his life at times. So, he needed to grow as a prayer. No one is naturally good at this. So James 5 teaches us to pray in all circumstances, and especially when we need healing. So prayer isn't just an occasional activity that we block out time for. We should have scheduled times for prayer daily or multiple times a day, but at its core, we can think of prayer more like breathing. We inhale our circumstances in life, and then we respond by exhaling in prayers to God. So, prayer is God's idea. It's His invitation for us to draw near. And here we see that He especially invites us to pray when we need healing. So, let's read James chapter 5 in verses 13 to 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, 
And he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So we see here that James is teaching us to pray in all circumstances, and especially when we need healing. His thought moves in three steps here. First is praying individually, and then is calling for the elders to pray, and then the third is praying among friends. So this is what we'll see, personal prayer, elder prayer, and friendship prayer. There's a place for all three of those in our lives. So James begins with personal prayer here. So whatever your situation, in any given moment, that is a moment for prayer. Verse 13, it says, if is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. So two ways of referring to basically all experiences of life. So the first is suffering. Many of the Christians James was writing to, he knew they lived in Jerusalem, but then persecution broke out against Christians. Many of them scattered away. Many were displaced. They were not wealthy. They were oppressed by the unrighteous rich. So he encourages everyone who's suffering to do one thing, and that is to pray. Now, that's not exhaustive advice for what to do when we suffer, but it's one essential thing that each of us can do. So what do we often do instead? What's our first response that's most typical in challenges in life? Well, we might grumble or get depressed or we go through our day with a grumpy and gloomy mood or we get frustrated by a family member and yell or we become passive aggressive to a coworker or we sink into self-pity. And James says, are you suffering? Well, pray. That's what you can do. One of my favorite books on prayer is called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. And he said he never started out to write a book on prayer, but he learned that God had taught him to pray. How did God teach him to pray? Well, here's what he says in the third sentence of his book. God taught me to pray through suffering. So if you want to learn how to pray from someone who learned to pray through suffering, I commend that book to you. A praying life. What do we pray for when we're suffering? Well, here's three kinds of prayer that you can offer to God in suffering. First, you can lament. Lament is taking your grief to God. The Psalms are filled with models of lamentation that you can use as your own prayers. Second, we can ask God to remove the suffering. He's the one who can change the situation. He's sovereign over all things, so you can ask Him for relief. Or third, you can ask him for transformation through suffering. So God has wise and good purposes through everything he allows in your life. We just sang about that. One of those purposes is to help you become like Jesus. So suffering is a tool that God uses to help his people become like Jesus. That does not mean that he delights in the suffering in and of itself, but it does mean that he's sovereign over all, And he doesn't have to allow anything into your life. So when he does, he has wise and good purposes for it. So when you suffer, ask God to help you endure suffering without sinning. Ask him to help you not grumble or whine or gripe, but to endure with patience. So what about when you're not suffering? What if everything's going well? Well, James says next, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So when life is going well, that itself is also an invitation to prayer. And it's the kind of prayer that he calls a song of praise here. So James said in chapter 1 that every good and perfect gift that we have has come down from God the Father. Everything good that you have that makes you happy, that makes you joyful, came from God as a blessing. So it's fitting to then thank Him in all those circumstances. So those are the two situations for prayer, when you suffer and when you are cheerful. And those two situations are umbrellas that cover any circumstance of life. So when you feel like clouds are gray over your life or that the sun is shining through, when you feel like things are dark or when it's bright, when you're sad, when you're joyful, you can pray. Do you see what James is doing here? He is teaching us to take every circumstance and turn it into a reason for prayer or praise. 
He's helping to cultivate a God-centered view of all of life, and not just a God-centered view, but a real relationship with Him. At dinner time, we go around the table, and we share highs and lows from the day. And then at the end of the week, we share highs and lows from the past week. Other people do this. Some people use the language of roses and thorns. What are your roses? What are your thorns from the day? I just heard some refer to highs and lows as beaches and leeches. I like that. Whatever works. And in all of these, James says to pray. I love what Alec Motier said about this. He said, the Christian life is to be an exercise in practiced concentration. So the Christian life, every aspect of your life, how should you think about it? He says it's to be an exercise in practiced consecration, to hallow every pleasure, sanctify each pain. Our whole life, he says, we might say, should be so angled toward God that whatever strikes upon us, whether sorrow or joy, should be deflected upwards at once into His presence. So, you and I go through our days, and we're just constantly being hit by things that make us happy, things that make us sad, suffering and joy. And what this is teaching us is to view our whole life as an exercise in practicing consecration, in deflecting and turning and rolling upward any circumstance into prayer or praise. It's an invitation to think of prayer like breathing. We inhale suffering, and so we pray. We inhale things that make us happy, and so we praise and exhale with praise. So this afternoon, you will have occasions to turn to God. Maybe you'll be reminded of the loss of a parent or a sibling or a friend or a child. Kids, you may be frustrated by a brother or a sister or your parents. Parents, you may be frustrated by your kids. And what you feel is an unfair frustration toward you, or you're frustrated by your spouse, or some of you will be annoyed by your aging and aching body. In all of those moments, James says, pray. Or you may feel joyful. You may enjoy the sun today, and a walk, and the breeze, or a friendship. And in that moment, turn in your heart to honor God, or with your words to praise God. If you want more help learning to pray like this, I encourage you to read a book on prayer with somebody. So I've mentioned many times the books in our resource center, we always have more than one copy because we believe it's important to grow together and read together. So grab a book, maybe grab a couple copies and give to someone, and then read it together and meet a couple times or once to talk about it and talk how to grow in prayer like that. So grab a friend and read a book on prayer. We have a bunch of them that are out right now on the table in the Resource Center um, on prayer. So this is personal prayer in every circumstance. Now James moves next to elder prayer, which is for when someone has a severe sickness. So this is James 14 and 15. James is giving practical guidance for when we're stuck with and struck with a severe illness. He says this, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. So here's the situation. This is not just a typical illness. This is probably a severe one, perhaps a sudden and severe and life-threatening sickness. This person seems to be unable to travel, and so they're probably bedridden because they need to call for the elders to come. It's severe enough that it warrants the elders, to come and pray for special prayer. The New Testament shows that churches were led by elders, which is a group of qualified men of character. Uh, Many churches miss this and have developed new traditions. So some churches are led by just a single pastor rather than a group of elders. Other churches are led by a group of deacons rather than elders. Other churches are led by a priest. Other churches are led by a general leadership board of men and women. But the New Testament model is for a group of qualified men to serve as that primary leadership role as elders. Now, this doesn't mean there can't be leadership among and within elders, like what some churches call lead pastor or teaching pastor and so forth, but it does mean that the church is ultimately led by a group of elders together 
And in the New Testament, the elders are called different terms. So they're referred to as elders or overseers or pastors. So the elders of a local church are the pastors of that local church. And these pastor elders are to pray for members who fall into severe sickness. So our elders view what James is talking about here um, as a great privilege and a sacred responsibility. So here's what James says is supposed to happen. The elders are to anoint the sick person with oil. Someone um, just brought this up a couple weeks ago with me. Um, didn't know I was preaching through James. I'm about to deal with this. It just came up in conversation. And they're like, do you do that at your church? Right? In other words, like, that seems a little weird. Do you guys do that? And I was like, yeah, we do that. It's actually not as strange as it may sound. Um, so we have a little bottle of olive oil. And we touch the forehead of the person who's sick with that oil. So we anoint that person with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus, as James says to do here. And then we pray. And James refers to the prayer of faith here. Now, what is the prayer of faith? Well, some people think this is praying with absolute confidence that God will heal. They think that if you pray with confidence that God will heal, then He will heal. But this doesn't fit the broader biblical teaching on prayer, and it's a damaging teaching. Many people have been disillusioned by this. Maybe some of you have. They prayed with confidence that God would certainly heal their daughter, but she still, still died. And then how, how are you left feeling? Like God didn't follow through for you. Or maybe you feel like you didn't pray with enough certainty, and when she died, you blame yourself for it. Or they think, if I only had more faith, she would have lived. But prayer is not a mechanical, magical process. Another option here is that this is a confidence, but it's a confidence that God himself gives when he is about to grant a miracle of healing. So it's like a spiritual gift from God in the moment. So when you're praying, when God is about to heal, he gives you faith that he will. But I think the most natural reading is that this is a prayer offered with sincere faith. This is not about trusting in a certain outcome, but it's trusting the God that you're praying to and that he can bring about whatever outcome he wants and that he does love to heal and he can heal. So we pray with confidence that God really does care and he really can heal and he really may heal. We all know the opposite of this, which is praying with skepticism We pray, but we doubt that God will actually do anything. That's actually how James began the letter, talking about praying and then doubting and being double-minded. You're not actually committed to the words you're saying. You're asking God to pray, but you don't really know if it'll happen. You don't really care if it'll happen. You don't really trust Him to do it. You don't think anything is possible there. But praying with faith means we trust God with the outcome, and we're also not surprised at all if He does heal in response to that prayer miraculously. So this is not a guaranteed method of getting a miracle. It's also not a healing rally here where one person is up on stage handing out miracles. There's nothing here about giving money for a miracle or buying specially anointed prayer cloths. Um, This is also the text that's um, used to support Roman Catholic teaching on last rites, Um, but that really does not fit with this text. Uh, Last rites would be a priest comes and anoints, and the person confesses sin so that they're forgiven before they die. But we see here in this text that this is prayer, um, not just with a priest, but it's prayer with elders, and it's even expanded to other people in the community. And the hope is healing. That's actually the expectation and hope for what will happen here. But let's notice something about this that we can often overlook. Do you see that James has two kinds of situations in view here? So one situation is someone who's severely sick, right? Is anyone sick? And there seems to be no reason for it. They're simply sick, and they need healing. But another situation's often in view. In some cases, the person may be sick because of unconfessed sin. God may be bringing this sickness into their life in order to bring them to repentance. Notice in verse 15, it says that this person will be healed, and if he has committed sins he will be forgiven. And then look look at verse 16. It says, to confess our sins to one another that we might be healed. So in some cases, confession is the condition 
for healing. Now, don't hear what this is not saying. This is not saying that every sickness can be traced back to a particular sin in your life. Most sicknesses are here seemingly because we live in a fallen world. So they can be traced back to one sin, but it's the sin of Adam and then all humanity in him, and we live in a fallen world that's now groaning under sickness. But in the book of Job, Job has all sorts of tragedies strike him even though he's done nothing wrong. And in John chapter 9, Jesus says that there's, there's a person who was born blind, and he says it was not because this person sinned, and it was not because this person's parents sinned, but it's for the glory of God. So it's dangerous to always assume that someone is sick or you're sick or suffering because of a particular sin. But there is a category in the Bible that we can call disciplinary sickness. If you are in a moral and spiritual spiral downward, God can use sickness to wake you up for your good. This happened in the Corinthian church. So in 1 Corinthians, this church had all sorts of moral uh, problems and division and a spiritual decline. And the Apostle Paul is writing to them, and he says in 1 Corinthians 11.30, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So Paul's explaining to this church who's racked with division, and he's saying, do you know why some of you in your church have gotten sick and others have died? It's because of this problem in your church. God is getting your attention. So this actually makes good sense of what's going on in James. We've seen in this letter that these Christians, many of them have a lot of sins in their lives. He's addressing quarreling, double-mindedness, and slander. It seems that these sins are leading to divisions in the church. So relational sin and church division are serious matters to God. And in the context of division, James now is raising the possibility, he's not saying that's for sure what's happening, but he's raising the possibility here that God has sent sickness. And so he says, call the elders and pray for healing. And if, again, he's not saying that this is certainly the case in every situation, but he says, and if there's sin involved, right, confess your sins and you'll be forgiven and healed. This also makes sense of the illustration about Elijah in verses 17 to 18. It's interesting. He didn't grab a story of Elijah of kind of a random miracle of healing, although Elijah was involved with these things. But he said that Elijah prayed for God to send a drought, and God did. And then three and a half years later, Elijah prayed for God to send rain, and God did. Do you know what's going on with this story? He prayed for a drought because Israel was being idolatrous. Elijah knew from Deuteronomy and Leviticus that droughts are one way that God disciplines his people to wake them up. God said he would do this in their history, that if they would reject him and fall away from him, he would send things like droughts to wake them up to repent and be restored. And so Elijah prays for this disciplinary judgment to come on a people who by and large had forsaken God. And then after three and a half years, the people did repent, and they turned back to God. And immediately after that, Elijah asked God to send rain, and God did. So this is a story of praying for God to restore his blessing after repentance. In other words, it's the same kind of situation that James is talking about here. So with severe sickness, James has two situations in view, two kinds of situations. In one situation, you may be severely sick for some inexplicable reason. You've not done anything wrong, you just need healing. So you call the elders for healing. But in another situation, James says you may be sick because of unconfessed sin. So he says, and if you confess your sins, you will be healed. So in light of this, how are we to view severe sickness? Well, you usually cannot know for sure if you are sick because of unconfessed sin. If a life-threatening illness comes out of nowhere, however, it is an occasion to check. So it's an occasion for self-examination. And 
you know, this isn't very common throughout the New Testament, so I know that this, many Christians don't do this, um, but it's a real category that every Christian should have. So if severe sickness comes into your life suddenly, inexplicably, it's at least an occasion to do some self-examination and consider, is there some sin in my life that I have let go unchecked and not confessed it to the Lord? Is He getting my attention for my good? So if you're sick because of an unconfessed sin, it's there not because God doesn't love you, but because He does. Consider that perspective that this actually shows God's heart for sinners and sufferers. He doesn't leave you there. He brings things into your life to wake you up, to restore you to spiritual sanity. He does it to bring holistic healing, both spiritual and moral and physical. So if you're sick because of unconfessed sin, it means that God loves you too much to let you go. And He's waking you up so that you would avoid a worse form of suffering, which is hell. He's inviting you into His love and grace and mercy and healing. So God loves us too much to leave us in our relationship-destroying selfishness. And consider the cross. This, this is the God who may bring suffering into our lives because of sin. Jesus Himself, He took upon Himself all of our sins and our sorrows and our sickness. He took our eternal suffering, the consequence for our sins, so that we then could pray and be immediately forgiven and in some cases immediately healed and ultimately in the resurrection healed. Finally, James moves from personal prayer to elder prayer and now to friendship prayer. So James gives a vision for how we can confess sins and pray for healing with each other. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So there are all sorts of situations that are less severe than would warrant calling the elders. And James is saying, in those severe cases, yes, uh, pray and pray for one another and call for the elders. But there are cases that are less severe, but they aren't, they're also times to pray. So do this for one another in the context of everyday life. If you're sick and you need healing, or if you have unconfessed sin in your life, Confess your sins to one another. Do this in your friendships. Relationships in church are to be the places for confession and for prayer and for healing. So what does this look like? How do we confess our sins to one another? Well, confession is ultimately, it's about honesty. It's about being honest with our sins and our struggles. So a verse we value as a church is 1 John 1, 7, which says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So confession is walking in the light. It's coming out of hiding in darkness and walking in the light of openness and honesty. It's coming out of the darkness of hiding and walking in the light of confession. Many people think of confession as morbid, but I love how John Stott put it in his book, Confess Your Sins. He said that confession, of course, can be unhealthy, Right, If you are repeatedly confessing the same event and occasion in your life that you've already confessed and received forgiveness for, if you just keep confessing that over and over and over again, that of course can be unhealthy. But he also said this, true confession is an essential condition to spiritual health. There is no misery of mind or spirit to compare with estrangement from God through sin and the refusal to confess it in penitence. And there is no joy like fellowship with God through repentance, confession, and forgiveness. So there's two categories, walking in the darkness, which is estrangement from God and others in our sin and unrepentance, and then we can step out of that into the joy of openness and honesty in the light. So who do we confess our sins to? Well, of course, the primary one we confess all of our sins to should be God. But James also says here to confess sins to one another. That's most importantly and primarily confessing to the person that you have wronged. So if you have wronged someone and sinned against someone, you don't just confess that to God. You go to that person and you apologize and you say, I'm sorry. You say specifically what you're sorry for and then you ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
This may also include confessing your sins to a trusted brother or sister. So that could be someone in your life who you know um, and uh, love and trust. And confessing your sins would be walking in the light with that person. It it would be bringing that person into your deepest struggles uh, so that they really know you and your sins. So is there someone that you're walking in the light with? I'd encourage every Christian to have at least one other person who knows you through and through, who you regularly have a time to meet to walk in the light together, to confess your sins to, uh, and to encourage one another with God's grace and forgiveness, and to pray for one another, as James says here. So James gives an encouragement for prayer at the end of the section. He says in verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. A righteous person is simply someone who is following Jesus faithfully. He or she is a sinner still, but who's walking in the light of honesty and confession. So God hears their prayers, and he loves to respond to them. And then James encourages us with the example of Elijah. So he prayed for a drought, and it came, and then he prayed for rain, and it came. And so we may hear that and think, okay, but he was a prophet, so of course his prayers were powerful. But notice what James says in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and yet he prayed and God responds. Do you see what James is throwing in there? He's not saying, Elijah was a great prophet, and so he, was, he had a special kind of prayer, and so make sure you have someone in your life you can find who's a prophet who can pray for you. No, he's giving Elijah as an example for all of us. Elijah was a man like us, a person like us, with a nature like ours, and yet look, God answered his prayer. It's the prayer of a righteous person, a sinner who was walking in openness and faithfulness. So here's some ways we can live this out together as we wrap up our time here. First, pray expectantly. God answered Elijah's prayers not because he was a prophet, but because he was a sincere follower. So James invites us to pray for healing with faith, with a non-skeptical trust in God. So does someone you know need healing. Do you need healing? Then ask God and trust that He can and don't be surprised if He does. Second, pray in all circumstances. Use prayer like breathing. If you suffer, pray. If you're stressed at work tomorrow, pray. If you are annoyed at home, pray. If you feel betrayed by a friend, pray. If you feel overlooked and forgotten, pray. If you're injured or sick, pray. If you're depressed and you have no idea why, pray. And if you're cheerful, praise. If God answers your prayers, praise Him. If you're in good health, thank Him. Third, pray together. Pray with friends. Find a close brother or sister in Christ and confess your sins and pray for one another. Pray in small groups together. Pray in a ministry team you serve with. Pray with your family daily. We have an email that Bob Ash sends out about prayer requests through the week of members of our church family, so email him in the office to be added to that list and then pray for one another. As you talk after the service here and you hear of concerns, stop and pray for one another. Finally, pray with hope. Sin and sickness are both here because of our fallen world. But Jesus has come, and he will come again to make all things new. So at his first coming, he came to deal with sin, to die in our place, to take the judgment that should be ours. He died and rose so that when we confess our sins, we might be forgiven and healed. And he'll come again one day to bring the healing that we long for, Because he does not always give us the miracle of healing in this life. And even if he does grant you the miracle of healing in your life, you're still going to die if he doesn't come first. And so we long for, no matter what, the ultimate miracle of resurrection, which is a finally and fully and permanently renewed and healed body, where sins and struggles will be gone forever. So we pray with hope, knowing that even if we don't get healing now, All who are united to Jesus by faith will be healed in the resurrection. So no matter what suffering you have, or even if you're in a season of no suffering, the God who made you invites you to pray. 
And if you've never prayed to him before, and until this morning you weren't even sure if he exists or if this Christianity thing is even real, then you can pray now. And you can pray for healing and you can pray for forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy to us. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve healing. We don't deserve your kindness. And so we thank you. We thank you also that you give us this clarity so that we can know what to do when we're sick. And so we pray that today and in the coming days and weeks, months and years in our church family, that you would lead us to examine ourselves, to consider if you're getting our attention with unconfessed sin, and that if we do have unconfessed sin, you would lead us by the Spirit to find spiritual healing and forgiveness through confession and physical healing as well. And we pray that you wouldn't let us unnecessarily dwell on our sin or in repeated confession of the same sin that we've already received forgiveness for, but lead us to live in the freedom of walking in the light before you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.